Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the AMD Ryzen-powered Huawei MateBook D. This is the first Ryzen device I have looked at here on the channel, and I'm very impressed with what I see here. It costs about $600, and I think delivers quite a bit uh, given its price and form factor. We're going to take a look at all the things that impressed me about it in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that Huawei lent this laptop to the channel, so we'll be sending it back to them when we're done reviewing it. All of the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This looks and feels a lot like a MacBook Pro, and that's not a bad thing. It's a very nicely constructed laptop for the price point. It feels really nice. Uh, it's all metal, and they did a really, really nice job putting this thing together, yet sticking to that uh, $600 or so price tag. It's got a 14-inch IPS 1080p display. It's got great viewing angles on it, and it also is a touch display which was a surprise to see on a laptop at this price point. So you can use it in touch mode. It's not a two-in-one, but the screen will go down like so. So you can uh, put it down on the surface of a desk or something and draw with your fingers or whatever. So you've got that option available to you there. So nice surprise on the display. It's got that AMD Ryzen 5 processor. It's the 2500U. There are versions of this with Intel hardware as well. So you'll want to make sure you're buying the right one uh, when you go and look for it because there are a bunch of different configurations you can get. It has eight gigabytes of RAM inside that's not upgradable. It is in dual channel mode to support the graphics infrastructure built into that AMD chip. It also has a 256 gigabyte uh, M2 SATA drive installed. You can upgrade that drive, just pop up the uh, bottom of the case here and have at it, and you can upgrade that M2 SATA drive to an NVMe drive, which performs faster if you want. So you can upgrade the storage, but not the RAM. And the laptop weighs 3.24 pounds or 1.47 kilograms, so it's not all that heavy. You've got a couple of ports worth mentioning, namely the USB Type-C port here. This is a full service USB-C port, so this supports power delivery along with video and data. So you could plug a docking station into this with a single cable and get everything you need with that one port. You got a full size HDMI port right here. You've got a USB 3 port over here, a full size one of those two. And you've got another USB 3 port here along with a headphone microphone jack. Uh, so nice complement of ports there, especially that full service USB-C port. The keyboard here looks almost identical to what we currently see on the MacBooks. Uh, I've not been a big fan of the new MacBook keyboard because those keys get stuck all the time. They've got that crazy mechanical design. Uh, this is a traditional membrane keyboard, but it feels almost identical, at least insofar as the keycaps are concerned, with my MacBook Pro. So it was a very familiar typing experience, but uh, I don't have all the keys getting stuck on me, and it's not as uh, thin of a traveling keyboard as the Mac is. So you've got a pretty traditional travel here on the keys and a nice keyboard layout overall. Uh, it's backlit as well. You have a pretty decent trackpad here. This is not as nice as the Mac, but it is uh, pretty responsive and uh, not bad for doing all the things you're going to do with your trackpad there. On some models, the power switch here is a fingerprint reader, but it does not appear to be the case on this one. So that appears to be the only feature that's really missing from this thing, and at its price point, I'm really not going to fault it too much for that. Let's take a look now and see how it performs. Now, before we get into some of the performance stuff, I just wanted to show you the PC Manager, which is their uh, little driver management thing here. It's very nice and simple. Uh, you click the check button, it checks out all the drivers to see if you're up to date. And I just thought it was nice to see something this simplistic for consumers that's not too bloated. So they did a nice job uh, helping people keep their computers up to date. As far as performance goes, it's very snappy and responsive. We'll go visit a few websites here so you can get a feel for that. Uh, we've got the 802.11 AC wireless on here, so it's you know performing pretty nicely and about where I would expect a $600 PC to perform. So you shouldn't have any issues doing your email and productivity apps and all that kind of stuff. And the display looks really nice too. Uh, the video playback performance is also good. We've got a 1080p 60 video here playing back from my YouTube channel. I see occasionally a drop frame here or there, but really you're not going to notice that it's able to keep up with uh, video playback here just fine. And if you are watching a lot of 60 FPS videos on YouTube and Twitch and whatnot, I think you'll have good performance even with Google Chrome. 
And on the browserbench.org speedometer test, we got a score of 90.9 on the 1.0 version of that test and 49.4 on the 2.0 version of that test. Uh, we're comparing it here to a Lenovo IdeaPad 530S we looked at a few weeks ago. Uh, that's around the same price point with an i5-8250U processor from Intel. Uh, that one did a little better on this test, but as you'll see in a few minutes, there are some tests where this processor will do the same or better. So it's a matter of what you're doing with it that impacts some of these benchmarks. But I think if you're using uh, this computer and doing some work and browsing the web, you're really not going to notice that much of a difference uh, in the real world here, even though the benchmarks might indicate otherwise. So I was very pleased with what we saw out of it. Now, battery life on this should be about eight to 10 hours doing web browsing and general work-related things, probably around that level for watching videos too. Uh, really, the display brightness here makes a big difference. So if you turn the display brightness down, you'll probably get a little closer to uh, that 10 hour mark, less if you leave the brightness up a little bit higher. But generally, I was uh, pleased with the battery life for the price point. It should get you through a work day without having to go and find a place to charge. What will tax it more, though, is gaming. And we're going to take a look at a bunch of games and some benchmarks because uh, this is a unique processor in that it has very good onboard graphical capabilities in addition to its CPU performance. And typically, for around 600 bucks, you get a nice laptop with an Intel chip that really can't play games all that well. This one's a little bit different, so let's take a look at that. So let's kick things off with the Time Spy benchmark from 3D Mark. There we got a score of 757, and we compared it to two laptops running with an MX150 GPU from NVIDIA. Now, the big difference here between this laptop and some of the other ones we've looked at with the GPU is that those GPU-equipped laptops have a second chip for graphics. This one is completely integrated into a single chip. That's one of the things that makes these AMD processors unique. And the performance here is not as good as that discrete GPU is, but it's very close and it's much better than what you would see out of an Intel processor. And as we dig a little further into these results, take a look at the CPU score on the Matebook compared to the Asus Vivo book we looked at a couple of weeks ago. They're almost the same here, even though we've got a quad core i7 on that Asus. And we also ran the lower impact 3D Mark CloudGate test. And there we got a score of 11,326. Now, if you look at the Xiaomi Notebook Air, you'll see that we're still below the MX150 in graphics performance, but the CPU here is much stronger, and that's why the score in the aggregate is higher. But if you take a look at the Lenovo IdeaPad 530S, it has an i5 processor that's going to be in a lot of computers at around this price point, but it doesn't have the GPU. And there you can see our graphical performance is almost double. So we're seeing surprisingly good computational performance and graphical performance out of this single chip for a very reasonable price. And that is one of the advantages of what AMD brings to market. And that makes these things actually pretty good at playing games. Not as good as a computer with a discrete GPU, but much better than what you would see with a computer without one. So let's get into some games now and see how this performs. So we're gonna start off with Fortnite and you're looking at the setting screen right now. We're rendering at 1080p uh, at the lowest possible settings. And we're getting about 30 to 45 frames per second in Fortnite. I think if you turn things down to 720p, you would, of course, do a little better there. Rocket League, we got uh, in the high 90s when we put everything at the lowest possible settings but at 1080p. I was also able to get it to run at about 20 to 30 frames per second with all of the settings turned up for a much prettier picture. But this gives you an idea as to what the highs and lows are with Rocket League. GTA 5 at the lowest possible settings we could do at 1080p was coming in at around 35 to 40 frames per second. Uh, so you can definitely do a little better if you went down to 720p there as well. The Witcher 3 at the lowest possible settings was getting between 18 and 20 frames per second. And as we saw on the MX150 based computers, which I'll put a link to down below in the video description, uh, we were able to get better frame rates out of those with the discrete GPU, but compared against a regular Intel based laptop, this is not bad performance, just not going to be as good as having a discrete GPU. But again, we've got a pretty affordable device here in a nice compact package. And we also tested its thermal performance with the 3D Mark stress test. That measures how well the computer does under load. There we got a score of 93.7%. 
That's a failing score because passing is 97%. Uh, so you'll probably see a slight amount of thermal throttling the more you place it under load, but it's not significantly so. Uh, but the fan on it is relatively quiet. It's got uh, some vents here in between the screen and the lower portion of the computer. And then it looks like the air intake is along here on the bottom. So you'll want to keep this area clear. And they got this little nub here to keep it propped up so that when it is on the desk, these vents are getting some airflow. So just be sure to uh, be careful if you are placing the computer under load and have it on carpet or fabric or something like that. Sound quality isn't bad out of it. Uh, there are stereo speakers on each side of the computer here. It's got a good depth of sound. It's very much a, uh, a full sound experience as you're listening to games and movies and whatnot, but the sound is a bit tinny. It doesn't have a lot of range to it. So I think if you're looking for better audio, definitely attach up a pair of headphones. And we got two more things to check out here. The first is Kodi Performance. We've got our usual test file that we like to run here, that file from Jellyfish. And this is a 140 megabits per second 4K HEVC file. And we're playing it back with only one drop frame at the outset, but it's been playing back just fine. So it does just as well as its uh, competing Intel devices playing back some of this higher end video. So 140 megabits per second is no problem and it looks great on here. And if Windows is not your thing, we found Linux to be operating quite nicely on this device. We've got Ubuntu 18.10 booted up right now. The touch display works here and was automatically detected along with full video support, audio's working, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the keyboard and trackpad all work just fine. Uh, the USB ports appear to be working too. So altogether, it looks like this might be a pretty decent little Linux device in addition to being a very nice Windows device too. So altogether, this is probably the best value I have seen in a laptop all year. It's got great build quality, really nice display here with the touch capability. Uh, the keyboard and trackpad feel pretty solid on it as well. The battery life is adequate. You also get adequate gaming performance. It's not going to be as good as an MX150 equipped laptop might be, but what we've seen at around the $600 price point are rather large and heavy laptops. And if you don't want that, uh, you can get close to that performance with something a lot smaller here. So there's really little to complain about on this one. They've done just a great job with it. If you are out shopping, make sure you look for the one with the Ryzen processor inside. They have Intel versions that look the same as this one does. So you do have to shop around a little bit to find exactly what you're looking for at the right price. But uh, you will get a great performing computer when you do track one down. I'll have an affiliate link to Amazon in the video description so you can find one over there. And I'm very eager now to see more of these Ryzen laptops. Intel really does dominate the laptop world as they uh, do a bit in other markets as well. But I think there's going to be some more hidden gems like this one out there. And I would love to get some suggestions from you as to what laptops we should look at next that are powered by this AMD chipset. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Too Much Sauce, Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.